technology of pumped storage has been around for quite a while, using water and gravity to supply power when needed. Swedish startup Mind Storage says it's revolutionized the process by repurposing brownfield sites, literally turning old mines into sources of sustainable energy. I sat down here at the COP28 talks in Dubai with CEO Thomas Johans. So COP28 possibly doubled the delegates that were at Glasgow two years ago. So it's actually a decision whether or not it's worth coming, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think it's very much about leadership. What kind of signals do you send? So by coming here and uh, I decided it's really worth it. I believe in what we can accomplish together by meeting, inspiring each other and also being an SME, really showing that we can also make a difference, not only the big corporations and the politicians. Yeah, and are you inspired, are you encouraged by the kind of people you've met here? Definitely, it's been really uh, an enjoyable stay so far. Well, that's splendid. Okay, let's take this to the studio and see if we can talk about it a bit more. Thomas, great to see you, thanks for joining us. Thanks, uh, Andrew. Great to be here. It's a pleasure. First of all, you know, big picture then. Give us your view of the climate challenge and also, of course, the importance of an energy transition. The climate challenge is here. I, I think most of us are now accepting that around the world, but we need to decarbonize now. There's no question about that. Uh, and if you look at the climate challenge, one of the key elements to, to, uh, to battle it, that's really to look at the energy transition. And the energy transition is really interesting. There's a couple of key key parts of that that I think are, are critical. One is that we're still using fossil-based fuel for production of electricity. Most, almost a, a third of the production is based on that. On the other hand, a very important trend is that we're, we're starting to e exchange fossil-based fuels for transportation as well as in industrial processes. So those two trends are really vital for us. Uh, to make that work, uh, we need to add a lot of more uh, electricity production and it has to be fossil-free solutions. And very much of that is going to be based on renewables. I was really pleased to hear a couple of days ago here at COP, more than 100 countries are committed now to add renewables three times what we have today by 2030. I've also seen studies that we have to have seven times the renewables uh, amount of production from today by 2040. So these are things that really are, are helping us in this uh, climate battle. Uh, but then there's a challenge to that as well. So we have a lot of fossil free production, mostly from renewables, but that will not be possible to just add into the grid because one of the dilemmas with, uh, with uh, wind and solar is that it's erratic. It doesn't really produce electricity when we need and when we want. So that's where uh, energy storage comes into the picture. Uh, I've uh, read a study by, by McKinsey not too long ago where they claim that there's going to be something like 10% of the electricity consumption in terms of energy storage. And of course, that doesn't say too much to us, but then if you make it in numbers, it's about 85 to 140 terawatt hours. And that corresponds to the same amount of electricity consumption in a country like Sweden in one full year. And the investments are vast in this area. To make that energy storage available for the system, we're talking about something between 1,500 and 3,000 billion US dollars. We have a lot of way to go still. We certainly do. And how does, how does mine storage fit into this picture? Well, we have a vision to be an enabler in this transition, in the energy transition. And our business idea is vast and ambitious. To give you a flavor of that, we're looking at qualifying mines. And we're using actually mines as energy storage facilities rather than, than uh, above ground storage. To give you a context on this, uh, uh, energy storage can be done in many ways. Over 90% of energy storage today is based on above ground pump storage facilities. And that has really been a support for the system for, for decades, even a century. Uh, but it's the challenge with, with uh, above ground facilities is that you need mountainous areas and you also need to, to get permits and you have a lot of uh, environmental challenges and it's also very costly and time consuming to build these huge facilities. So what we've decided is to look for below ground solutions, hence mine storage. So we're actually looking and there's a million mines around the world. So it's not the problem to find in sites. The challenge is really to select the right sites and that's when we come into the first phase of our business uh, processes. That is the qualifying sites. 
The second phase in our business uh, processes, that is to develop the projects. We're a private company, so we need to see business opportunities. We need to pro see profitability in what we do. So we're looking at business cases as a key element in the whole process. But during the development process, we secure that there's a business case and we also secure investors to support us. The third phase in our business processes, that is the, the construction phase. And the fourth and most important phase, that is the operational phase. So we're managing assets and also co-owning co them. So what have you accomplished so far with all that list of uh, things to do? Yes, yeah, you can hear it's quite ambitious. We've been around for three years. We're based on risk capital. Uh, so already now we have about 10 sites in the Nordics where we have either already uh, secured land rights or we are in the process of negotiating land rights. We have uh, accomplished uh, a lot of things also in the US. We now have a, a co-partner. Uh, Darlene Power Cooperative, and we're looking into mines in their territory. And this is one example of what the, the challenges are. We, we start off with 30,000 mines, and we screen them down to 80 mines, and now we're looking at a handful. And together with Darlene, we're looking at how to secure the land rights. Similarly, we have a project in, in Sweden, with a, a collaboration project with Mela Energy. It's a regional utility owned by the municipalities in that region. And together with them, we're also looking at up to three sites where they have committed to be a co-investor in those projects. So that's a few things that we've done already. So Thomas, can you give us an idea of exactly how the, the technology works? Yeah, I mean, this, this concept is it's beautiful in its simplicity. And I have to give you our elevator pitch to start with, because we use the cleanest media there is, water, and the most reliable force, gravity. And that's basically everything that's needed. So what we do is we bring water from one elevation by pumps, taking electricity from the grid, uh, driving pumps and pumping water to higher elevation. And thereby we have stored the energy in the water just by having it at a higher elevation. When we want to, to release the energy, then we just release the water and it goes through a pipe called a penstock. And at the bottom there, there's a turbine connected to the generator and back into the grid. So it's completely circular. It's, it's circular, yeah. And the beauty is that we're using abandoned mines. So we're actually taking what we call scars in the landscape and repurposing them. So it's like a liability from a mining company and we're converting it into asset, into the energy industry. So there's a lot of uh, good values out of this from a technical point of view, as well as from a commercial point of view, from an environmental point of view. So it's a true circular thinking here. So all these different companies probably come into COP28 for the first time. I, I get the feeling they will get reassurance by seeing how many different operations there are around the world with the same energy and the same innovation that they have in their own particular sectors. I think this is a, a, a truly inspiring event. I mean, and I, I was at the dinner yesterday and was so much intelligent people. I was just amazed about what you, what you learn and, and what you realize by listening to others. So I, I think we should never neglect the value of meeting together. So I, I think even though people are questioning the, the traveling for many of us coming here, again, people meeting together, that's the way to find solution, getting inspiration from each other. So we need to remember that. It's interesting to see that you're setting a sort of example. Why, why is it important for everyone to demonstrate uh, what they can do in the, the fight against climate change? Uh, this is a good question because I was really hesitant when I first got the question to, uh, to travel to Dubai to COP28 because I, I think leadership is very much about sending signals. And I think the elephant in the room is to, should you actually travel so many people to Dubai to talk about the climate? But when I thought it through, I thought that, I mean, it's obvious that large corporations, politicians are participating in these things. But if I, as a, as a leader of a fairly small company, also shows that this is important, that I spend the time and, and that I shouldn't say that I can inspire. Uh, but if I can at least give some ideas to other people around the world, that also the, the, the people like me in fairly small SMEs can make a difference. I think that may, made it uh, a clear positive answer for me to, to join this event. What are you hoping to accomplish over, the, say, the next 10 years? Again, we're having a really ambitious plan. So the, 10 years from now, we're looking at having 10 facilities in operation around the world. So we're starting off in the Nordics, we're starting off now in the US, but we're also having plans to establish ourselves in, let's say, at least a handful of markets in the next 10 years. Uh, Europe is obvious, given our, our uh, headquarters in, in Stockholm, Sweden. But there's also a number of interesting markets around the world, looking at Australia, South Africa, Chile. So the, the world is really 
open for these kind of solutions. But I also think it's really important to be successful in the future, you need to attract people. So one of the really exciting things that we are doing, because we're a real experienced team, uh, most of us have been uh, at high level senior positions in, in uh, established companies, but we all said that we, we want to take the risk to do the best we can before we retire in terms of really uh, accomplishing this, uh, this is vision that we have. And to be able to do this, we also need to be an attractive employer. So it's really one of these fantastic things that we're doing. We're setting up a corporate culture from, from day one, starting from scratch. And I think that's part also of the journey, that we're really committed to doing good for the world, as well as having a really enjoyable and, and profitable business. Thomas, thanks very much indeed. Pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Andrew.